Welcome to Cove Presbyterian Church. Today I will play movements two and three from Sonata in C major, Karl 330 by Mozart. Years after Mozart's death, all his published music was categorized chronologically by the musicologist Ludwig von Kochel. And that's how we refer to his many compositions now. It always has a capital K period, and that's, that's what it means. He composed 18 sonatas for piano, and this one falls about in the middle. I have always loved the second movement of this sonata that's marked andante cantabile, which means singing. The beautiful melody returns several times in both major and minor keys, and the tempo is a comfortable walking speed. That's what andante means. Movement three, marked allegretto, provides a cheerful ending to the sonata. <clears throat>
Friends, I'm glad you have joined us for a worship at Cove Presbyterian Church today when I'll be preaching a sermon called The List That Matters. It's based on a reading from the 10th chapter of Matthew. I invite you to listen to God's word today. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, Thomas, James, Thaddeus, Simon the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. Here ends the reading of the word of God. Let us pray. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, who is our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Matthew loves lists. He begins his gospel with a long list of who begat whom. And today he is at it again. I notice this about Matthew because I love lists myself. I find few things more satisfying than crossing off just enough items from one list to warrant making a new one. The uninformed and uninitiated do not appreciate lists. They rank list making right down there with scribbling. Well, to all the non-list makers listening to this sermon, I beg to disagree. A list can be critical shorthand for crucial information. It says a great deal about what's on your mind and what is not. Just ask Matthew. In the middle of our text today, Matthew provides a list of the 12 disciples of Jesus. If you doubt the potential power of list or wonder why Gary is going on about something as mundane as making a list, Take a look at what biblical literalists have done with Matthew's list of disciples over history. For years, biblical literalists have used this particular list to decide who is in the church and who is not. For instance, did you notice that there is not one woman mentioned in Matthew's list of disciples. You can bet that biblical literalists have noticed. For centuries, they have used Matthew's list as a warrant to keep women out of church leadership. No women on the original discipleship of of Jesus means no women in ordained leadership of Jesus' church. No women as pastors as elders, as deacons. Now, if we're going to follow the logic of biblical literalists, then we need to say goodbye to Renee and Pam and our session clerk, Mary Lee. They are all ordained elders in this church. And what was Cove thinking when it called Marcy? or Gay Lee, or Jane. Had your pastor nominating committees not read Matthew's list? And you say lists 
are not that important. One problem I have with biblical literalists is the narrow way that they read Matthew's list. While many of them read Matthew's male-only list as a reason to exclude women from church leadership, they ignore that most of us, male and female, would be excluded from church leadership if we truly read the list in a literal way. For Jesus says to these newly ordained male leaders, go nowhere among the Gentiles. That would be us. Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. If Jesus' list of disciples in Matthew is a reason to keep church leaders male, then why is it not also a reason to require all church leaders have direct Jewish ancestry? Jesus calls these newly minted leaders by a new name. Not disciples, but apostles. Or from the Greek, his sent out ones. Jesus does not focus on their gender or religious ethnicity as much as he focuses on what he calls them, apostles. Children of God sent into the world to follow in the spirit and direction of Jesus. Matthew's list of names is not the list that finally matters. It is the list that follows, that truly matters, as Jesus sends apostles to bring health into sick situations to challenge injustice when it is safer to stay quiet at home, to insist on sane public policy where madness reigns. Not one of these newly minted apostles are the promised Messiah or our Lord and Savior. So what qualifies them to be ordained to such a demanding vocation? Hold on, and I'll return to that question. Some years back, I chaired a body of presbytery that works with church committees called PNCs, Pastor Nominating Committees. When I asked most PNCs what would qualify a candidate to be their next pastor, I heard a version of the following answer. We want a man who is younger than 40, who finished at the top of his class in seminary and college, who has 30 years of pastoral experience, who is social media savvy, who is happily married to a woman, who is a cooperative and loving wife, and they have two well-behaved and idyllic children. He must be a great preacher, a great teacher, a great scholar, a great administrator, must visit in members' homes on a regular basis, and must always be available when emergencies arise. Now, go back and take a look at the first apostles that Jesus calls. The first sent out ones. What are their qualifications? Matthew tells us precious little about them, but what we do know does not inspire great confidence. Nothing, Matthew tells us, explains why Jesus chose this particular group. They have few, if any, apparent qualifications for such demanding leadership. In one scene of Andrew Lloyd Webber's Jesus Christ Superstar, The original 12 apostles are sitting around the table, sitting because mainly they've had too much to drink, and they sing, always hoped that I'd be an apostle, knew that I would make it if I tried. Then when we retire, we can write the gospels so they'll all talk about us when we've died. This rather crass song reveals a rather crass reality in the church. Nothing is more dangerous than pastors, elders, and deacons 
who think that they are fully qualified for their calling. Few things are more frightening than church leaders who are convinced that they deserve their positions of authority and that God and the people of God cannot survive without them. Matthew does not give us a CV on the first disciples called to be apostles. He says that Jesus called them and Jesus gave them the authority to go out and be the church. Maybe that is all that we finally need to know about them. A few years back, I had the privilege of preaching the commencement sermon at Union Presbyterian Seminary. I duly noted my thanks to so many gifted future leaders who were graduating that day I commended their fine theological education. Then I reminded them of the charge of Jesus to a newly minted group of apostles. I urged these graduates never to forget that a church leader is not defined by racial or gender identity or age or degrees held or officer training completed. I reminded that not one of them is fully qualified to lead the people of God, but every one of them had been given authority to do so by the grace of God, the grace of the one who chose to build the church on such rocky soil. Now, I wish that Matthew's list of apostles would have named women following Jesus because we know that there were apostles who were women who first came to the empty tomb. I wish that Matthew's list of apostles would have described the ethnicity of each person called because we know that Jesus And Jesus' apostles had far different complexions and religious identities than mine. Throughout my ministry, biblical literalists have waived their list, be it from Deuteronomy or Matthew or the Apostle Paul, lists designed to exclude people from the church. As I read the list from Matthew, two things matter. Jesus names a motley crew of apostles and he says to them and to all who would be apostles following them, go and proclaim the good news. Go and be the good news. Then he issues this very specific list. Go and cure. Go and give life. Go and cleanse. Go and cast out the demonic. Go and give generously and with reckless abandon. He gives that to-do list to the likes of Peter and Andrew, Thomas and Thaddeus, even to Judas Iscariot. He gives that list to Fran and Rahima, to Nick and Oliver, to John and Jean, to you and to me. And as far as I'm concerned, that is the one list from Matthew that finally matters. Amen. And now receive the benediction. Go into this world that God so loves to be makers of peace and justice. And as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.
Welcome to Cove Presbyterian Church. It's a delight to welcome two dear friends, Sam and Debbie Heewall, who are members of the church I served in New Purdue some years ago, Hilton Presbyterian, and have remained great friends since and are wonderful musicians. I hope you'll enjoy their music today. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, Gary. Sends down his love. Sends down his 
going to sing a hymn now that's familiar to everyone for the beauty of the earth. For the beauty of the earth, for the glory of the skies, for the love which from our birth over and around us lies. Lord of all to Thee we praise, 
Bye.